Wow, no time limit? Just kidding. Uh, yeah, I hear him beeping over. Beep, beep, beep. On the study of uh, Judah alone, a few weeks ago my wife told me something and I find it very interesting and I just wanted to share it with you. There were two old boys, we're just going to name them, Bubba and Jim Bob. They're your typical rednecks, they're out hunting. And Jim Bob begins to have some pain and begins to feel kind of sick and then all of a sudden he grabs his head and he just falls out on the ground. Well Bubba's standing there with him and so he grabs his phone and he dials 911. The operator gets online he says, oh man, my friend, he's just falling out. He's, he, I think he's dead. He's dead. The lady says, well, calm down, calm down. He says, well, first of all, we need to make sure that he's dead. Okay, okay. So he puts the phone down and runs back and all of a sudden, she hears a gunshot. Boom! He comes back, picks the phone up, says, okay, now what? <laughs> I present that to you because after the study of these kings, after each one, you begin to ask, now what? Now what are they going to be involved in? They had some good qualities. Some of them had good qualities. Others did not. But during this time, it was a very bleak history for Judah. According to Usher, the time period that we're looking at is approximately 722 to 586 B.C. And it corresponds to the fall of Israel, to the fall of Judah. In which time period is recorded in 2 Kings 18 through chapter 25 and 2 Chronicles 29 through 36. Now the parameters of this paper was supposed to be 10 pages. And I've got like 40 chapters. And I had to condense that. So I went about it in a way. Basically I presented to you, just gave you a little background on each one of the kings. And then I talked about the prophets that served during that time. And that's basically how the book is broken down. My chapter. We're not going to spend a lot of time on each one of these. I'm going to spend some time on some of these kings. And then the others we're going to mention and kind of move on. The reason is because... I want to talk a little bit about some of the prophets, but I won't talk too much because other people are going to be dealing with those same names. And so I don't want to uh, kind of be too redundant, even though repetition is a good thing. Uh, after you do it four or five times, it becomes very redundant. But anyway, the time period covers the reigns of Hezekiah, Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Hezekiah. Oh, and Ze uh, sorry, Zedekiah and Gedaliah. Uh, we don't hear a lot about him, but he kind of came in there towards the end uh, and was presented. Judah alone covers a period of approximately 136 years from the fall of Samaria in 722 to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Assyrians in 586. The reigns of Asa and Ahaz lay the foundation for what is going to take place during this time period, in particular Ahaz, um, and how that uh, part of his reign was during the end, and then the last few years of his reign was during Judah alone, the period that we consider this. The early years of Judah was a period of spiritual decline. Things seemed to get better during the reign of Asa, and the early years were devoted to reforming Judah, but Asa's faith seemed to suffer a decline when he entered into a league with Syria against uh, Israel. Judah's history was like a roller coaster. It had its ups and downs. And just like all the history we've already studied, we saw, we see this over and over and over. And it just kind of gives us a little, I guess, a uh, way to be calm about what's going on today in our country. You know, it, it's like a roller coaster. We're going to have our bad times. We're going to have our good times. And it just continues on uh, through history because man has not changed. And it continues to be the same problem. In the end, the roller coaster hits bottom and did not rise again. And Judah had run her course. Following the reign of Joash, Josiah, it speedily met its doom. 
Judah took the final plunge in attempting to make alliances with other nations in hopes of saving herself from destruction. And by this time, Assyria was no more. And Egypt was reduced to nearly nothing. And there was nowhere to turn. The waves of mighty forces were quickly approaching from the east. Babylon, acting as an agent of God, was the final ruin of Judah, bringing to an end the monarchy. monarchy. So let's look at some of these rulers. Ahaz ruled for possibly 16 years. And like I say, part of his uh, lead was during this time, and on in, uh, in a little further into uh, about six years into what we call the period of Judah alone. As soon as he came to the throne, he began to follow the Canaanite religious practices. He even sacrificed his own children to the false gods. Because of his sins, the Lord allowed the Philistines, the Edomites, the Syrians also to invade and conquer the border cities of Judah. It was during this time that Judah lost the port of Elath on the Gulf of Aqaba. And if you begin to look at this, all these things on the map, you begin to see that a lot of these things were their way to get from one part to another. Well, if you start sealing them off, they're not able to get outside if, uh, goods and things from other places and being able to come and go as they please, well, they begin to cut them off. And because of military threats, Ahaz made alliance with the Assyrians. And what he began to do is to rob the temple of its money to bribe these foreign dignitaries. And in return, the Assyrians offered to attack Aram and Israel. Israel confronted Ahaz and advised him to trust in God uh, instead of Assyria, Isaiah, I mean. He even offered to give Ahaz a sign from the Lord to prove the truth of his words. But Ahaz wasn't going to have anything to do with it. He didn't even want to see the sign. And so, the sign, as we see in Isaiah 7 and verse 14, was the sign of the coming Messiah. And that was the sign. Well, Ahaz didn't want anything to do with it. Israel took uh, an opportunity uh, around 727 or so to revolt, stopping payment of this annual tribute. But Ahaz, on the other hand, didn't stick with that. He continued paying, and it saved him in one sense uh, from being attacked by this foreign country. Well, the city fell then in 722, and the population that was left behind was then deported. The northern kingdom of Israel had ceased to exist, and the Jews of the southern kingdom were terrified as they watched the many inhumane cruelties that the Assyrians inflicted upon the captives. And now the Assyrians began to eye the southern kingdom of Judah. And it was only a matter of time before they would attack. And you began to look into the different types of things that were going on there. Um, even though Judah had forfeited its freedom and paid heavy tribute to Assyria, economic prosperity as it had been established under the other uh, policies before them, um, they began to go downward. They were losing money. They were not able to keep up and to provide, the, particularly in one sense, the military that they needed to be able to protect themselves. And even with the great prophet Isaiah as a contemporary, Ahaz promoted idolatry and its practices. In accordance with the heathen customs, he had his son walk through fire, and I can't even picture that. But uh, he did that very thing. He not only took many treasures out of the temple to meet the demands of the kings around him, but he also introduced the cults into the very place where God himself was to be worshipped. He brought those things into the temple. And little wonder that Judah would then incur God's wrath. Then we get to the second king, Hezekiah. He served for about 29 years. And although he uh, continued to have problems with the Assyrians and in league with them in, in a sense, Hezekiah survived many of the crucial, crucial attacks that came upon Jerusalem. During the last decade of his uh, reign, Manasseh, who became the next king, uh, began to co-rule with him. And uh, Hezekiah, in addition to this, uh, it shows this in 2 Kings 18 through 20, as well as in 2 Chronicles 29 through 32. 
In a drastic reaction to the deliberate idolatry of his father, as Hezekiah began his reign with the most extensive reform in the history of the southern kingdom. With the king realization that Israel's captivity was the consequence of broken promises to God, Hezekiah then began to uh, bring about reform. He immediately reopened the temple. The Levites were called in to repair and cleanse the place of worship. That which was, had been used for idols was removed to the brook Kidron, where the vessels that had been used then uh, were sanctified. And in 16 days, he brought about enough reform so they were able to open the temple again for worship. <clears throat> Hezekiah, as well as other officials of Jerusalem, initiated the sacrifices then began beginning again in the temple. Musical groups with their harps, cymbals, and lyres were participating, as had been, in the, as they say, the custom in the time of David. In an attempt to heal the breach that had separated Israel and Judah since Solomon's death, the king sent letters throughout the land, inviting all of them to come to Jerusalem for the Passover. And after some did ignore this invitation, there were those that did come, from Asher, from Manasseh, from Ephraim, from Issachar, as well as Judah, to participate in the festival. And in council with those who initiated the worship in the temple, Hezekiah announced the celebration of the Passover, but, as has been stated in other lessons, he, stated he wanted it to happen a month later than what God had commanded to be done. Um, there are a lot of people who have a lot of different theories about this, but many think that what was going on is he was trying to give some of these other people that were out and out saying, I'm not going to be there, give them time to kind of change their mind and to be there. And he set up the celebration for a month later. Um, but what they began then, altars throughout the capital were moved to the Kidron Valley for destruction. Led by the priest and the Levites, the people offered sacrifices. They sang jubilantly and rejoiced before the Lord. And from Jerusalem, the Reformation extended throughout Judah. Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. Hezekiah had, been destroy, uh, had even destroyed the bronze serpent that Moses had made in Numbers chapter 21, verse 4 and following. Because the people were now using that serpent to worship as an idol. So even Hezekiah destroyed that. Inspired by the king's example and leadership, the people went out then and began demolishing the pillars and the ashram and the high places and altars throughout all the land. Hezekiah then organized the priests and the Levites for regular services. The tithe was then reinstituted. Plans were made for regular observance of the feast and the seasons as prescribed through the law. Through the law. But Hezekiah... As good in some ways as he may be, it just wasn't quite enough. Because the people, as you know through their history, he didn't bring all of the people along to his way of thinking. To ensure Jerusalem of an adequate water supply during many prolonged, particular prolonged siege, Hezekiah constructed a tunnel that connected the Siloam pool with the spring of Gihon. Through about 17 to 1900 foot of solid rock, they went through that to bring forth a channel that brought in fresh water. And what that did for them is during long sieges, it gave them the ability to have fresh water. And they also had the ability to stop water pools outside of the city. So when the invading armies came, they would have to bring their own water or go a long way away to get more water and bring it back up to where they were. And the city, Jerusalem, was able to have that water to get past uh, what was going on. And as you know, Sennacherib later in his life became very ill. Isaiah came to him and warned him that he must then be preparing for death. And Isaiah prayed to God and, well, God extends life for 15 more years in order for him to uh, deliver Jerusalem from the Assyrian threat. Knowing that he had but 15 years before the termination of his reign, it only seemed natural then that he would begin to co-work uh, with his son Manasseh 
uh, with him on the throne at the earliest possible opportunity because Manasseh was a young man at the time when he began to co-work with him. Then we look at Manasseh. Manasseh is credited with the longest reign in the history of Judah. From the pinnacle of religious fervor and the southern kingdom catapulted itself into the darkest era of idolatry under the leadership of Manasseh. He resembled his grandfather Ahaz in bringing about the biggest ruin, and particularly uh, socially as well as economically within the city, the people, because they went back to idolatry. By rebuilding the high places and erecting the altars to Baal and constructing the ashram, Manasseh plunged Judah back into a gross idolatry such as Ahab and Jezebel had promoted the northern kingdom. Even the Amorite deity Molech was acknowledged by the Hebrew king in the sacrifice of children in the Hinnom Valley outside Jerusalem. Astrology, divination, and occultism were, pot, were officially sanctioned as common practices. In open defiance to God, altars for worshiping the host of heaven were placed in the courts of the temple, while graven images of Asherah, the wife of Baal, were placed in the temple itself. However, later on in his life, he repented when he was taken off into captivity. And he acknowledged God during this captivity. And in the Reformation beginning in Jerusalem, he exemplified the fear of God and commanded the people of Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. But the problem with this, as well as as we look at Josiah here in just a minute, you can't force people to be faithful. You can't force them. No matter who you are as king, no matter how many edicts you may bring or how many death threats you may give someone, unless they are truly converted in their heart, they're not going to be 100% with you. And that's what was going on during the times of many of these kings who, in some sense, tried to go back and change idol, idol worship. But they had problems. Then we look at Josiah. He grew to manhood. He reacted to the sinful conditions of his time. At the age of 16, he was earnestly taking God into account rather than a confirming, uh, conforming himself to idolatrous practices. In the 18th year of his reign, while the temple was being repaired, the book of the law was recovered. Prompted by the reading of the book of the law given by, of the Lord given by Moses and warned of impending judgment by Huldah, the prophetess, Josiah and the people observed the Passover in a manner that was unprecedented in the history of Judah. Drastic measures were taken to rid the country of idolatry. After a 12-year appraisal of the conditions, Josiah boldly asserted his kingly authority and abolished pagan practices throughout Judah as well as among the northern tribes. Altars of Baal were broken down. Ashram were destroyed and vessels dedicated to idol worship were removed. And in the temple, where women wove hangings for Asherah, chambers of cult prostitution were renovated. Horses, which were dedicated to the sun, were removed from the entrance, and the chariots were destroyed by fire. The horrible practice of child sacrifice was abruptly halted. And the, the altars erected by Manasseh in the court of the temple were crushed, and the pieces were scattered in the Kidron Valley. The priests themselves dedicated to idol worship were removed from office. At Bethel, the altar was destroyed by Josiah. This altar was pulverized and the Asherah, which probably had replaced the golden calf, was burned. High places were removed and priests were arrested for their idolatrous ministry. Under the king's leadership, the elders of Judah, the priests, and Levites and the populace of Jerusalem ascended, assembled for public reading of the newly found book. Immediately, plans were expedited for the observance of the Passover. Priests were anointed, were appointed, and temple service was reinstated. In the Passover ritual, great care was ex ex exercised to conform to that which was written in the book of Moses. 
When the book was read before him, Josiah was terrified because of Judah's failure to obey the law. What alarmed Josiah was when, when he asked for prophetic advice was the fact that our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord. And this goes back to what the ground that's already been laid by the speakers today. One of the things God told those kings, when you first become a king, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> Write the law down in your own handwriting and keep that with you and read it over and over and over. Somewhere along the line up to this point, that had stopped. And now here's Josiah who hears the law read and he realizes we're not doing what God wants us to do. So he chooses then to do so. It, it kind of brings to my mind the idea that he understands that ignorance of the law was no excuse. Even when the book of the law had been lost for some time. Because those priests, those Levites, they were still priests. And they should have been pushing themselves what should be going on. But Josiah learned. And when the book of the law was actually read before him, he vividly realized that curses and judgment would do an idolatrous people. <clears throat> Jeremiah was called to begin a work with him during about the 13th year of Josiah. Jeremiah's preaching in chapters 2 through chapter 4 reflects the relationship that was strained between God and Israel. And Josiah then begins to take advice and work from Jer uh, Jeremiah to begin to learn uh, the things that he has to do. Uh, later on in... Uh, at his death, Josiah went into a battle in Megiddo in an effort to stop the Egyptians. And he was fatally wounded when his armies were routed. And after 18 years of close association with Josiah, the great prophet Jeremiah said, it was said of him that he lamented for Josiah. So he even saw the great work that Josiah did do in trying to bring about uh, the change. Uh, in the people. Then we go on to look at Jehoaz, which ruled for about three months. He remained on the throne, and at the time of that, and at this time, Pharaoh Necho came to Jerusalem and deposed Jehoaz, placing a tribute on the land of Judah of about a hundred talents of silver, silver and a talent of gold. Later, Jehoaz was taken into Egypt for the remainder of his life. Not much of a ruler rulership for three months. Jehoiakim, uh, we know about him, the idea that he began, Jeremiah began prophesying about 20 years when Jehoiakim became king. The prophet denounced the wickedness of Judah and warned that Jehoiakim would die and instead of a royal burial, he will be given the, accorded a uh, burial of like a beast of burden. And that is basically they just take you out and they're done with you. Not like a royal uh, funeral for a dignitary. Um, Nebuchadnezzar uh, at Carchemish on the Euphrates, the Egyptians were defeated with enormous losses. And they retreated south when Nebuchadnezzar hot on their heels. And Nebuchadnezzar pursued the e Egyptian forces all the way down to Palestine, encountering no serious resistance along the way. And as he arrived in Canaan, he called for Jehoiakim, king of Judah, to swear allegiance to him and pay a tribute. Jehoiakim complied and was permitted to retain his throne. Nebuchadnezzar also took hostages from among the Hebrew nobility at this time, and one of those hostages is one that we'll meet later, and that's Daniel, uh, that was taken into um, servitude. Nebuchadnezzar mounted an invasion into Egypt, the outcome of his campaign was then decisive, which each side inflicted heavy casualties upon the other. And as a result, Nebuchadnezzar returned to Babylon to regroup and strengthen his forces. Jehoiakim saw this interpreted as a defeat for Nebuchadnezzar. He promptly rebelled and allied himself with the Egyptians. Well, that wasn't a defeat for him. That was just him going back to regroup because he came back later with force and he took him, took him down. 
And then later he took him into chains and they placed his 18-year-old son Jehoiakim on the throne. He ruled for about three months. And during this time, uh, he's also known as Kanoia, was about 18-year-old when he became the king. Nebuchadnezzar set him up on the throne and then moved him down to Egypt. While he was in Egypt, uh, he foolishly rebelled contrary to the advice of Jeremiah. And Nebuchadnezzar returned, recaptured Jerusalem, and took Jehoiakim, his family, his servants, and princes, threw them into change, and marched them down to Babylon. This was the second deportation of the, the, the people of Judah. And among them was the prophet Ezekiel. Then we have Zedekiah. Having deposed Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar now placed Zedekiah, uncle to Jehoiakim, upon the throne of Judah. Zedekiah was constantly facilitating between Egypt and, and Babylon. In 593, about when Necho died, representatives from the city, states of Edom, Moab, and Ammon, and Tyre, met in Jerusalem, hoping that the new Egyptian ruler would join them in a new rebellion against Babylon. However, the new Pharaoh adopted a policy of non-interference. And the plot against Babylon led Zedekiah on the spot. And he had to travel to Babylon where he swore allegiance again to Nebuchadnezzar. He, uh, later on we see that uh, this continued on. Zedekiah would send messengers to Jeremiah uh, asking for help for, from God. Jeremiah's response was that Jerusalem was doomed. Uh, they had already made their bed. They must lie in it. They must deal with the, the uh, choices that they have made. God's going to allow these things to continue on. Uh, he's not going to save them. And the siege of Jerusalem began on January uh, 588, and it would be another year and a half before the city was taken. And part of that, like I say, was because of that underwater passage that they had built and that was able to sustain them in some sense. The siege of Jerusalem was temporarily interrupted with Pharaoh led the Egyptian army up into Palestine in an attempt to relieve uh, Tyre, Tyre and Sidon. Meanwhile, Pharaoh's army had set out from Egypt. When the Kal Kal Kaladian, Kaladians, who had been besieging Jerusalem, heard the report about them, they lifted the siege from Jerusalem. Many of the inhabitants of the city were relieved by this, thinking that it indicated a turn of their fortunes. Instead of heeding in the warnings of Jeremiah, they strengthened their resolve to hold out against Nebuchadnezzar. And on July 10th, 586, Nebuchadnezzar, his forces broke through the northern wall of Jerusalem. It would be another month before the southern wall would be taken. Zedekiah was forced to watch as his sons were executed and then his own eyes were put out. That was the last thing he saw was his sons being killed before him. He was thrown in the chains to be dragged back to Babylon where he would then die in prison. The Jewish survivors were hauled across the Syrian desert to Babylon. Many of them died in route. The southern king of Judah now ceased to exist. Jerusalem was burned and the walls of the city were torn down. All the military, civil, and religious leaders were either executed or carried away in captivity. Only the poorest peasants of Judah were allowed to remain in the land that was by now completely desolate. Uh, Gedaliah, as we mentioned before, he came on, he basically was put in position to kind of rule over this region. It was uh, after the destruction of Judah, and he was allowed to. Uh, rule, but basically for about two or three years, and then he was taken out. You had a lot of, you had several prophets that were going on during this time. You had Micah, who uh, was one of the prophets, Zephaniah, Nahum, and then Jeremiah, Habakkuk, as well as Daniel, uh, Ezekiel. And through looking at all of these, we began to realize that no matter what these people did, no matter how good some of them may have been as far as in their mind, in their estimation of what they were doing to do right, that God's will was done and he allowed 
for them then to be taken away, just like he did the northern kingdom. What we did then was just give a general overview of the history of Judah alone. There are a lot of lessons that can be learned by this. And some of them uh, I put in the book and others I did not. But I, I want to just kind of go over some of these just a little bit. You know, even short-term leaders have long-term consequences. You look at some of these kings, they were only in, some of them less than five years. And yet, things that they put in place in the short time they were alive, had its consequences because it turned the tide and caused the people to go further and further into sin instead of changing. You look at Josiah, who was eight years old when he began to rule. He was one of the more righteous of the rulers there in Judah. But just like I began, like I said earlier, it's a situation with Josiah that he can lay down all the decrees he wants to. He can try to force people to, to turn back to God and do the right thing. And, and for some, the, the, the faithful, they will do what's right. But generally speaking, if you don't convert the hearts of the people that you rule, then they're going to continue to harbor in their heart the sin that they, can, that they have been involved in. They will not ever truly convert. And I look at Josiah and I think about, you know, a lot of times young people are kind of overlooked. And we realize that Josiah, at his age, was able to do great many things. And we as Christians need to realize, you know, our young people, I don't know about you, but the congregation we're at, we got a lot more older people than we do young people. And I can include myself in that group now. I used to, didn't. I used to laugh at you people. <laughs> but the ages 40 and below are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I believe that, that puts incumbent upon all of us as gospel preachers, as elders, as leaders in our local congregations. You need to go back to the old way that I understand this. I wasn't alive during those times. But I do remember we'd go to gospel meetings sometimes. There'd be a guy that would show up to, to preach, and he would have one or two young men with him. And what he did is he took them around with him, and he taught them how to speak, how to rightly divide the Word of God, and all those kind of things. And, and we have other things to do that also. But my point is, we have to instill in our young people a hands-on process. Um, I hate to say this, but it's true. Our young people, and I'm saying 20 years and younger, a lot of their parents are the problem. It's not those kids. It's the parents. Their parents are not fully converted. And I agree that we need to work on the parents and we need to convert them, we need to teach them, we need to, to ground them, we need to do all that we can for them. But meanwhile, their kids are being left out to, left out to dry. They're just being left. And they're being raised by the schools, they're being raised by their best friends, the kids that they associate with, the, the movies they watch, the television they watch, the games they play. Those are the things that are raising a lot of those kids. And you know as well as I do, not very good, very many good things are coming through those avenues. We need to concentrate on our young people. Spend a couple of extra minutes to say hello to them, encourage them, and uh, offer opportunities for them to be more active in things that we're doing. A lot of times uh, there is a generational thing, I will say, all of us were young, we looked at the older people, and, you know, sometimes we weren't so close to them, maybe as we ought to have been. But we need to put a concentrated effort on that for the future of the church, for the future of the church. Um, I'm not an alarmist. I'm not one that goes around like Chicken Little and just, oh, you know, like this all the time. But it is something that I see that's going on that we need to be concerned about. Fathers and sons, you know, this idea that we are all born depraved and all this, we see that looking at some of these leaders, you see where the, the father may be righteous and the son is unrighteous. Or you look and you see the unrighteous father, but yet the son 
has some righteous things about him. The well, same thing goes on in our lives today. We shouldn't, because maybe a father or a mother is not raising their children right, just write the whole family off. We need to think about that next generation. What can we do to establish them, to bring them along? And then lastly, like I said before, in the case of Josiah, we can't force people to be faithful. We can't force them. And when I say that, I don't mean that we don't discipline, that we don't correct. We don't, I don't mean it like that. I'm just saying we can't just bring people along and, and say, if you don't do this, I'm not going to be your friend or I'm not going to have anything to do with you. That's the wrong approach. We need to teach people to be, pray, be willing to do that. And I know that I'm speaking to the choir here in one sense because all of us are from faithful congregations. Otherwise, you wouldn't be working there. You'd be unemployed, you'd be working for the state or something else, doing some kind of secular work. But we need to work on this, preparing our young people. Because where are our next Josiahs? Where are our next preachers? Where are our next elders? They're coming from our young people. And we have to concentrate, give them the experience that we have learned to try to instill in them how they can help the church to be carried on into the next generation, the next century. And when, we, when we're gone, you know, I think about this a lot, particularly when I have a 10-year-old, only a child I have, I think about her. What's her life going to be like when she's in her 20s and her 30s? What's the church going to be like? What is the world going to be like? And what is going to cause this world to change? It may be a case just like Judah, where God's long suffering is just about gone. And next year we may be having the Japanese, the Chinese, the Russians, Muslims, whoever. Maybe the United States of blank instead of the United States of America. So it's something for us to think about and pray about and use as examples the Old Testament. There are lessons to be learned at that's been said over and over and over. There are great lessons to learn from these in preparing the church for the next generation and for the next generation. What are we going to leave them and what are we going to do to help?